coming up in this episode. When we aren't giving ourselves the space to really think and reflect, what happens is that we're limiting how much of our potential that we can truly access. You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and in today's podcast, we are joined by Simon Alexander Ong. Simon is a life coach and business strategist. As a coach, he works with individuals to help improve performance, both individually and within teams. And today, we'll be discussing elements from his book, Energize, Make the Most Out of Every Moment, this book right here. And Simon and I had a really interesting conversation. We talked about how to manage your energy. Recently, I've been thinking about this idea of energy management over time management and this sort of synced up well with the way that I'm thinking and this conversation as well. And we talked about some habits that you can use to become more productive at work, but also in life in general, and really to be more centered and appreciate everything that happens in your life, whether good or bad. Interesting conversations, and I think timely given the emphasis that workplaces are putting on mental well-being, but society as a whole, especially in the UK. I'm not too sure about different parts of the world, but definitely in the UK, this way of thinking is becoming more prevalent, especially in the workplace. So definitely interesting having Simon on the podcast, and I really hope you enjoy our conversation. Simon, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. And thank you so much for sending me the book. You know, I love reaching uh, authors reaching out to me and, and discussing um, ideas in their book and and their story to, to writing the book as well. And I think yours is an interesting one because recently I've, I've been speaking to a lot of authors about this idea of moving away from time management to energy management. It seems like productivity perhaps has become a bit pernicious to the degree that people go to the degree of like scheduling one down to every minute of their lives. And I think a lot of people are perhaps switching away from that to discovering, you know, how can they manage their energy rather than their time. So I think your book is timely in that manner. And, you know, it's definitely something that has been on my mind recently as well. So before we get into some of the elements of the book, I'd just love to discuss, you know, in the beginning of the book, you talk about your transition from the corporate world into, you know, the world of training and coaching. So I'd just love to get a bit of your take about the reasons why you made that switch and, and, and your journey. Sure. I, I think the switch was probably something that was that was long overdue uh, because I, I grew up with this mistaken belief that I had to go to college. I had to graduate with a good degree in economics, maths, law, accountancy, one of these traditional subjects, uh, and, and then go forth and work in, in the city, uh, the city here in London, where you have these major institutions located. So when I, when I started, uh, as delighted as I was to get a full-time job after graduation, it was also the worst time to begin uh, because this was at the height of the financial crisis. And it was also a painful experience because I had this ambition of growing and developing and moving up the career ladder, collecting those bonuses, collecting those perks, and then maybe down the line at some point in my life, evaluating what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But life works in very interesting ways. And so I had this opportunity to begin to reflect on what I wanted to do a lot earlier than, than I had imagined. Because the crisis happened, I ended up going to another job. Uh, in fact, I was in and out of jobs for nearly 10 years. And I couldn't hold down a job for more than a couple of years. Either I resigned or I was made redundant. Mm. Now, in hindsight, uh, it was probably the universe giving me a sign that I wasn't meant to be employed. But at the time, it was it was very challenging. And I think if it wasn't for the crisis being the catalyst for me questioning what I was doing and whether I wanted to do that for the long term, mm. I may still be working in the financial industry today because the the crisis almost forced my hand to ask myself those deep questions at a lot earlier stage than many people do. 
Mm. Uh, so that's really what kickstarted my journey uh, into what I now get to do today. I think it's very interesting because I think a lot of people, especially me in my early 20s, I started my grad scheme for the civil service and you were told, you know, go to university, get your grad scheme, then you can sort of move up. And, you know, grad schemes do a really good job of teasing you into their system. They're like, OK, you start here and then you can be there in two years, there in five years, there in 10 years. But like similar to you with me, it was very much the case that, you know, circumstances happen and opportunities come up, which you would never have thought of. But those circumstances and those opportunities in, in retrospect are actually really, really beneficial. Mm, mm, definitely. And, and I think it taught me, it, it taught me a lesson looking back, uh, which is we are going to face many setbacks, many challenges um, and many obstacles in life. But actually, when I look back, it is those events uh, that equip us with the wisdom to create the best moments of our life. So mm. whether it is the financial crisis that kickstarted my thinking about what I really wanted to do in my life or the passing of my mom when I was 17, really teaching me the fragility of life um, and not to wait. Or whether it is failing my second year of university and that experience teaching me that I wasn't meant for formal education. I think mm. while we may not heed the lesson at the time, uh, I think if we have the humility to seek the lesson within each of these moments, then there are seeds of opportunity that can help us become a stronger individual. Mm. And and that transition from, you know, thinking about perhaps, you know, introspective thinking and in respect to, you know, what you actually want to do, what was your process for doing that? Because I think a lot of people are in that position, perhaps COVID has, has enlightened them to perhaps what they can do um, rather than what they're forced to do in, in a way or what they're forcing themselves to do. What were some of the ways that you transitioned and what was some of your thinking? I, I think it began with a, a couple of questions, uh, simple questions, but I think questions that require us to take a step back and, and really reflect on. Uh, and, and they were things such as what did success mean to me? Mm. What did fulfillment look like? And, and what sort of impact did I want to have in the world? Now, these questions, we may think we know the answer, but I guarantee many of us haven't taken the time to really explore it. Because when we think about energy, most of us are exhausted, not because we're doing too much, but often because we're running someone else's race. Mm. And so we, we touched on just now uh, about having to go to college and getting a good degree and getting a job that pays well. Now, I had to start questioning whether that was my version of success or somebody else's version. Mm. And so once I started to gain clarity as to what did success mean to me, and what did fulfillment look like and what sort of impact I wanted to have in the world. The challenge I had, and I think the challenge we have, is to then build our life and career around those answers. Now, of course, we won't know all the answers up front. But when you first start asking yourself these questions, you may have some idea. But as you start taking small steps forward, the map gets revealed to you. Uh, you, you start to take small steps forward and then you get more clarity, you get more insight, you get more confidence to take more steps forward. So for me, it really began with those questions. And when I thought about what impact I wanted to have in the world, it made me realize that I couldn't have that impact of doing what I was doing in that moment. And then what came next was the question of whether I was committed to actually taking action on the answers that I came up with. Mm. And I think that word commitment is, is so important because there is a big difference between the word commit and interest. It's why many people set New Year's resolutions, but in fact, New Year's resolutions are merely a list of interests. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to be healthier this year. I'm interested to change jobs. I'm interested to finally start that idea or project or business. But many of us make the same resolutions the next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. And that is because we're only interested. And so the question I had to ask myself is, Simon, are you committed to making this a reality? And the beauty of questioning yourself to test your commitment is that once you're committed, your mind moves to how. Mm. Your mind begins to work from the space of how. And the reason that is a beautiful space is because once your brain starts thinking how, you're moving towards an action-oriented mindset. 
you're not worried about if you're going to do something, you're now questioning how. How are we going to connect with these people? How are we going to start making that first step? And that's when your brain starts coming up with ideas for that small action to take next. So for me, it was beginning with those questions and then asking myself if I was committed. And then finally, having the courage to take those first steps. You know, often many of us say, I'm waiting till I'm confident and then I'm going to take some of these steps into the unknown. Mm. The fact is, you only get confident once you take those steps. Mm. Confidence is built once you show yourself that you can do something that the previous you thought you cannot do. Yeah, that's one of the things that I get quite a lot is I get sent uh, messages about, you know, what books can I read to increase my confidence or self-confidence? And there's no book <laughs> that's going to increase your self-confidence. The only way that's going to happen, like I have a sports background, so I love playing sports. I played sports. I played every sport when I was a kid. And I look back to, you know, the things that gave me perhaps self-confidence or self-belief. And that all came through training and then performance. So you have to put in the time to do the training and the practice in whatever thing you do. But then once you perform that, that's where the confidence comes from. You know, practice is only practice. But once you do it in, you know, the last five seconds or last 30 seconds of a game, whatever it might be, that's really where your confidence and self-belief comes from. Totally. And, and that is why I think the, the feeling of momentum must never be underestimated. Because once you start taking these steps forward on a regular basis, what happens, there is a feeling, and I think the closest way we can describe that feeling is I am going places. It's a feeling of I am going places. Deep down, you know you're going somewhere. You might not know where yet, uh, but just having that feeling of that I feel like I'm going somewhere because of the action that you are taking, that builds up your confidence reserves and it inspires you to take even bigger action. Mm. And that's something you can't get before you've taken that first step. You've got to take those first steps to build up your confidence bank. And that starts the engine that will help you move forward even faster. To go back one step, uh, you talked about really interesting, the difference between an interest and a commitment. Mm. How much do you think the the disparity between interest and commitment has got to do with what you choose not to do rather than what you choose to do because i think so much of that commitment is actually choosing what not to do people think oh yeah i need to do x x x but i think once you actually strip away what's really important saying you know i'm not going to do this i'm not going to do that then the things that you need to do become apparent definitely i, I think you you've made a good point there because often in the in the field of personal development and self-help we think that we always have to be doing something or adding something to our routine uh, or, or, our, or our day. But actually, it's about the hacking away and what we're saying no to in order to make space and give oxygen to what matters most. Because so often what gets sacrificed is the very thing we know we must do, but we just don't have the time or energy to do it because we're getting distracted by all the other things that simply don't matter. And so when we do think about commitment, it is as much as about what you're committed to do as well as what you're committed not to do. Uh, and that is why when we think about to-do lists, I think what is more important is your not-to-do list. Hmm. What are the things that you are committed not to do so that you have the boundaries around you that is protecting your energy so you can focus and channel it into the things that will actually help you move forward? How much do you see that in your coaching and training people who try and do too much? Because I think it's a perhaps a, a burden of overly ambitious people feeling that they can do everything <laughs> and anything. I, I, I think you're right. I think with clients of mine who are super ambitious or who are in positions of leadership, slowing down and switching off is a big challenge. It is a big challenge because they've grown up in this culture in which they feel that if they're not doing something, then they're not productive. Mm. And so working from that belief means that they will never put the necessary boundaries in place in order to perform at their best. Because what's happening is they're killing their potential by trying to do everything. And we're only human at the end of the day. We only have 24 hours in a day, and there's only so much that we can do. So actually what happens is that when we have the ability to slow down in a world that is getting increasingly noisy and distracted, that is actually a superpower in today's world. 
And it's also where we can access our creative potential. You know, if you look back in history uh, at some of the anecdotes of how Isaac Newton discovered gravity with an apple falling on his head sitting under a tree or Archimedes with displacement theory lying in the bath or Thomas Edison fishing with no bait. Now, I don't know if these anecdotes are true or not, but I think there is wisdom in the fact that these breakthroughs came not when they were sitting on their desk, staring into books or screens, but actually by disconnecting, by mm. putting up these boundaries to give them the space, the time and the energy to think, to connect these dots that they, that they get with the inputs that are bombarding them all the time and to then think, well, how can I connect this strand with that strand to open my mind to different perspectives? And I think that is what is often lost in today's society is that when we aren't giving ourselves the space to really think and reflect, what happens is that we're limiting how much of our potential that we can truly access. That's a, it's a fine balance though. It's something that I really struggle with because it's like, you need to find the time to do the things that you want to do around, whether it be work and you have like yeah. personal hobbies, you have family commitments. And like you said, you've only got so much time in the day. And then you think to yourself, well, if I'm not doing this now, then I won't do it, if that makes sense. But you've made a commitment to do it. So how do you, how would you go about navigating, you know, and helping someone in that situation? If they've got limited time, they've made a commitment to do something, whether it be a personal project around family and work, but you know, you're advising and people that do advise, you know, to find time, you know, just to reflect, but it's, it's difficult if you've, if you're limited in, in that respect. Yeah. I, I would first challenge the perception that, that we have limited time uh, because I know uh, that when we say we don't have time for something, what we are actually saying is that this is not a priority for me because put it this way, if somebody said to you, you've got to watch this new Netflix show, it is amazing, it's getting rave reviews, it's number one trending. What happens is suddenly you find time to watch that Netflix show every single day so you can finish the season. I do the now, opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. I get so many, so many of my friends, I've, I've never had Netflix, but it's one of one of my friends, uh, some of my friends always ask me, it's like, I've watched this, I've watched this. I'm like, I'm not going to watch it. Like, I, <laughs> I've like, I've made a commitment not to watch it. And I always I tell that. them that. That's, that's great because that shows your awareness <laughs> of committing not to let that take up some of your time. In, in... And they're so, they're so disappointed. And I, I, find so much, <laughs> I find so much joy in it. <laughs> but, but the funny thing is, uh, for many of us, we get seduced uh, to suddenly find time to watch it. So what happens yeah. is that becomes our priority. So when we say we don't have time for something, it simply means uh, that right now that is not a priority for me because if something is important to you, you will find the time to do it. Now, when I work with my clients, when I speak to audiences, one of the things that we can do that I suggest to them is to schedule in your calendar or diary me time as much and as quickly as you do your work meetings, your social events, and your holidays. Because once we have work meetings come up, once we have social events come up or holiday plans, guess what? We're very quick to put it into our calendar. But how quick are we to schedule me time into our calendar? Now, what happens is that until we do that with as much vigor and effort as we do those other events, then other things will always take its place. And so until we schedule it, me time is never real. And that's why it's important as a first step to start scheduling those things in. Now, it doesn't have to be every day at the beginning because you don't want to you, you don't want to jump into the deep end. You might just go to yourself, well, I'm going to block out two hours every week as a first step. And in that two hours, I'm not going to be connected to technology. I'm just going to switch off for two hours, go for a walk in nature, read a book, catch up with a friend outside over a pint of beer, whatever it is, start with something small and then build up. And then you can start blocking out more time. Because what happens is that once you start blocking out some more me time, what you're doing is you're creating a bit of a rhythm in your routine. You're creating a bit of an energetic rhythm between periods of deep work and periods of intentional rest. Now what happens is you start to leverage this natural cycle that we humans have. You know, if you look at how an athlete trains, they don't work in the gym, uh, pushing weights and uh, doing their cardio for eight to 10 hours straight. They understand that in order to be prepared for the big event, they've got to manage their energy cycle. They train hard and then they rest. They train hard and then they rest. And this cycle will be different to each individual. 
And it's the same for us. But once we understand how we operate, how much rest do we need, how much periods of deep work do we need, once we start to understand that we can better plan our days, our weeks and our months. I love this exercise that I read a couple, I can't remember which book or whether it was an article or video, I can't even remember the source, but it was like, track your energy over like a week long period. Like where do you peak? Where do you sort of dip? Because I think it changes for each person. You know, people yeah. talk about like the, the mid afternoon sort of dip. Um, but what I found is when I was fasting one year and I was mm. traveling into London, I wasn't eating, but then in the morning I was like really attentive. But then as soon as sort of like 12 o'clock hit, it was like down, <laughs> it was a no go. <laughs> but what I found is like from nine o'clock till like 12, you know, PM, that is like those three hours are like mm. deep work, you know, Cal yeah. Newport talks about deep work. So I like, I scheduled all of like my hard intensive tasks in those three hours periods and then you can focus your know, like afternoon on like emails and meetings but i think that awareness about energy and and how your rhythm works is so important and not to rely on what other someone else says about their own rhythm because mm. it's completely different it's it, it's an absolute game changer as well because i've i've been speaking about this with some clients uh, not just individual clients but but organizations and teams of individuals yeah. and, and here's a fascinating insight that, that came from one of these meetings I asked the, the team leader of, of one of these organizations, I said, tell me when you hold your most important meetings for your team each week. And he said, Monday mornings when everyone's back in the office. And I said to him, now tell me, what is the energy of your team first thing on a Monday? And there was a small chuckle and a laugh and he noted what I was trying to get at. And he mm. said, well, I can't imagine the energy would be particularly high because they've just come back of a nice weekend and it's probably the usual Monday morning blues. And I said, so we've got a really fascinating situation here. On the one hand, you accept that your team's energy isn't especially high first thing on a Monday, yet you're holding the most important week meeting on that Monday morning, expecting them to contribute, to share their input. So you see there's a bit of a, a contradiction here. And so what happened is that he rescheduled that weekly meeting to a Wednesday morning, mm -hmm. and guess what? Suddenly, everyone was speaking out more, everyone wanted to contribute, everyone just felt more energetic. Because by the yeah. time you got to Wednesday morning, you've found your pace, you've got into the week. But first thing on a Monday, in which your leader expects you to contribute and you're not feeling particularly energized, you're not really working with your team, you're working against them. Yeah, if my manager did that, I'd be having words. Be like, this is, it's, not, it's not working for me. I actually did that in a previous job. Like in, in when I was working for the civil service, I found myself, you know, people used to book meetings for like an hour. Mm -hmm. And the utilization of that one hour meeting must have been at like 5%. Because like yeah. people would just talk about anything and everything bar the thing that you had scheduled to speak about. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be the case, perhaps in the workplaces, a lot of the time, it's like meetings for the sake of meetings. Mm -hmm. And I think as an individual, it's very difficult to navigate that field if you're trying to get what you need to get done, but then you're, you're being bombarded by meeting after meeting after meeting. <laughs> and, and there's a funny joke I, I often share is that when, when we think about public speaking within companies, a lot of employees experience what I, what I, what I call death by PowerPoint. Because mm. a lot of presenters rely too much on PowerPoint rather than actually expressing their communication through their body language and, and their voice. And I think it's the same thing with meetings. With a lot of companies, when we think about productivity, what happens is that they experience death by meetings. Mm. And what I mean by that is productivity gets squashed by the fact that meetings begin to take over the time that we could have to focus on the actions that would move us forward. Have you worked with any companies that have been experimenting with a four day work week? So I've heard that quite a few companies now are experimenting with four day work weeks. Have you had any experience with working with companies like that? And what have been their feedback on sort of a ground level? Sure. So the one company I have had experience with is actually an asset management company. Okay. And I have to caveat that it's not the asset management company as a whole, uh, but it's one of the departments within the asset management company. Okay. So I, I, I worked with this group leader and what he's done is he already has been implementing four day work weeks for nearly four years now. Okay. And what he does on top of that, which I thought was incredible, is he encourages people to use some of those days off 
to pursue their passions. So to go to a conference, not necessarily connected to work, but connected to the things that interest them. Mm -hmm. So they may go to uh, a festival about a particular topic that uh, interests them. Uh, They may fly to uh, an event about property, about sailing. It's very eclectic. But the reason he's done that, which I thought was wonderful when I heard the feedback, is what happens as a bit of accountability. He gets them to, when they do come back to the office, to share their takeaways from those Mm. conferences, from those seminars that they've been on, even if it has nothing related to their actual job. And what he has discovered is that once they start sharing their takeaways or their lessons, it actually ignites the creativity of the team as a whole. Because what what they're experiencing is they're understanding how different industries do something. And by bringing some of those ideas into their industry, that's how they're starting to be innovative. And so I thought that was amazing when he told me how this process has been turning out. And it's interesting with that one, because then you're learning as a whole team, you're learning about, like you said, how different industries work, but then also what your team members are passionate about, which I think Mm -hmm. a lot of teams struggle with is who is the person behind the person that comes to work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think when we expect people just to be one type of person, uh, we're actually stifling creativity. But when we allow people to explore what they're interested in naturally and then share it with us so we can see how they think and how they learn and how they operate, what happens is that we can start talking about how we can include that in our decision making process. You know, you work with a lot of high level execs and, and, and big companies. And I think a lot of workers are struggling to try and find, you know, the common good habits in order to become more effective at work, you know, not just more productive, but to maximize the energy resources. So like, mm. what, do, what would you say some of the good working habits that you've seen in the working place that people can implement to then, you know, maximize the energy resource at work? Sure, well, I'll share a couple of what I would call lifestyle habits uh, and also some professional habits because i think we we need to have a bit of both uh, when we think about habits to bring more energy into into our life so in terms of the personal lifestyle habits i think the first thing that all of us can do is to plan our day the night before now what happens is that many of us simply don't plan our day the night before so we wake up and we, we kind of think, oh, I forgot to do this, or I forgot to do that, and I've got to pack my bag, and I've got to remember to bring this to the office. And so we end up leaking our energy first thing in the morning with worrying about what are we going to do today? Have I got everything? What am I going to wear? And so if we can actually eliminate those choices and make them the night before, it means that when we wake up, we actually wake up calmer and more relaxed because we already know Uh, what is our most important priorities for the day. We already know how we were understand that today will be a productive day, but also we've got everything in place. So if you are planning to go to the gym in the morning, if you've got your gym bag already packed, Mm -hmm. ready by the door, you don't have to think about what to wear. If you've already got your suit out, your clothes that you're going to wear to the office, and that's hanging on on your peg, then again, you've eliminated that decision. So what happens is that when you do wake up in the morning, you're much more focused on channeling that energy into the things that actually matter. Now, the uh, the additional benefit of this is that it makes you have deeper quality sleep. Because without having to think about all of this when you sleep and having all of this ready planned out, you can actually just ease into sleep a lot quicker. So that's the first thing that I believe we can all do. The second is something I touched on earlier which is to make sure that we have regular periods throughout the day in which we can step away from our desk, in which we can disconnect so we can reset and recharge uh, throughout the day. And the third one is movement. For me, it is why I started the first chapter in the book titled Invest in Your Health. Because for the healthy person, they have many wishes, hopes and dreams, but for the sick, they have only one. And that's why moving your body is one of the fastest and easiest ways to create more energy. Now, you may not always feel like you want to work out, but I promise you that you never regret the feeling you have after you finish the workout. So those would be a couple of lifestyle habit tips that I would share. In terms of the professional habit, one of the things that can help us create more energy is nurturing, developing, and cultivating our relationships every week. So what I mean mean by this is 
building relationships, not just with people in our team, but people outside of our team, within our organization, or even within our industry. Because when you go to work, knowing that you have things in common with other people, when you have somebody that you can share your challenges or your thoughts with or your concerns with, it actually is, is p- positive and productive for our mental health. And so those would be a couple of the uh, tips that I would share both on a personal lifestyle side, but also on the uh, professional side. That movement one is really important that you talked about mm-hmm. when exercising, because I think anyone who does exercise thinks that, you know, they might have a really tiring day and they mm-hmm. might think, you know, if I exercise right now, I'm going to be even more tired. And it could be more from the truth because it's like it gives you that energy that you that you need in order to do what you need to do. And, 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 it, and, it's, and it's an interesting fact to be reminded of is that when we do something that gives us energy, by doing that activity that gives us energy actually helps us create more energy. Mm. You know, it's like when you do something, uh, some work that is aligned to who you are, that allows you to express your potential and your strengths and your talents, what happens is you actually feel even more energized once you do that activity. And so I think it's a, uh, it's a great justification to follow the things that actually make you feel alive and bring you joy because what happens is that itself will give you more energy. Mm. And I think that's perhaps what a lot of people are struggling with. One of the things that I get is like, how do I find that? You know, how do I find that one thing? And obviously there's no silver bullet to that. I think everyone's on their own journey. But, you know, when you speak to audiences and where you consult people and work with them, like how do you ask or how do you guide them in order to find that thing that gives them energy? Sure. And I think it's a it's a good question because a lot of us wait and, and until we know what that one thing is before we take those first steps. Yeah. And so it's very easy for us to use that as an excuse. So if I say to somebody, for example, what sort of work are you doing now? And they might describe their job or their business or uh, some project that they're involved in. And then I might say to them, is what you're doing making you happy or bringing you joy? And if they say no, I will say, well, what is stopping you from discovering what that other thing could be now for a lot of us we then say because i don't know what it is and so i'm not going to take any action until i find out what that one thing is but the irony of that is we don't discover what that one thing is until we take some action and so for me rather than dwelling on what that one thing is which can often be overwhelming can be very heavy to think about what that one thing is is actually to start with a softer question which is what am I most curious about right now? Mm. And right now, each of us will be curious about something. Now, to give you an example, when I was in the corporate world, the first thing that I was curious about was becoming an entrepreneur. Now, I didn't know what I wanted to start a business in. I didn't know to be an entrepreneur of what. But the very fact that my curiosity was about entrepreneurship meant that I started to read books about entrepreneurship. I started to go to conferences about entrepreneurship and business. And as I started to hear from people who, who, who were sharing their journeys, uh, who were sharing their lessons, that led me to expand my network into the business field. And from there, I got my first business idea. And then I got my second idea. The first two didn't work out, but it led me to what I now get to do today. Now, that would never have happened if I didn't follow my curiosities. Now, what's important to understand from this is that your curiosities may not always get you to where you want to be initially, but it will always get you to where you need to be because sometimes it will lead you to a lesson or an introduction or an insight that will help you get to that next stage. And so for me, it starts with what are you most curious about right now and how can you start to follow those breadcrumbs of insight if you will so that eventually it will lead you to that river of purpose it's interesting because like i always advise people who ask me about book recommendations to follow their curiosity Mm -hmm. because i think a lot of people what they tend to do is they follow possibly similar to like jobs or career paths they follow what's going to make them the most immediate financial gain Mm -hmm. 
and you know they might read a book because they feel like it's going to make them a lot of money initially or they might start like in your case like a business or something that might you know is the in thing at the moment but it's not aligned to who they are as, as a person and their purpose and i think you're so right like the curiosity is always going to benefit you in one way or another whether it's the the journey to do so or whether it's the eventual destination that you get to definitely i mean even even harvard business review wrote an article uh describing curiosity measurement as cx uh, sorry not cx cq as your curiosity quotient so we know about iq which is your intelligence we know about eq which is your emotional intelligence and harvard business review talks about cq as your curiosity quotient i.e how curious are you as an individual and what they've learned from various studies that have been uh, done by universities is that the more curious you are, the more successful you are. Because when you're naturally curious, what that means is that you also have a learner mindset. You have a desire to learn, you have a desire to expand your knowledge and your understanding of topics or themes. And that means you're going to have a very different perspective and insight than the majority uh, in your field. I'd be interested what they say about directing that curiosity because it can get quite thoughtful after a while after you go in like a hundred different directions and you kind of th sit there thinking okay what do I do with it now which perhaps is like the reader's dilemma that one <laughs> definitely I think that is a big balance between uh seeking information uh but also applying the information and, and it's getting that sort of balance between the two right because knowledge is is potential power but I think the real magic lies in the application of that knowledge yeah, and I think this goes back to what you talked about in the sense of New Year's rev resolutions and the fact that what's an interest and what's a commitment, like mm. what is, and that's why I always tell people it's like, you know, choose books on two things, either a subject that you're interested in, or a skill that you're looking to learn. Because yeah what a lot of people I think do is they just pick something because other people are reading it, but this doesn't apply to mm. them. So they read it and it's sort of just wasted time to a degree. It could be, I consider it procrastination because you're just reading something for the sake of reading it, but then there's no mm. follow-up to that. Totally. I mean, if, if, if we start to think of that at a higher level, it's, it's almost about designing your own learning curriculum mm. and design your own learning curriculum around what is most important to you uh, but also, what is your vision? What is it that you want to achieve in your career, in your business, in your life? Uh, and what are the books, the videos, the podcasts that will help you make that happen? And yes. what's happening here is that you become someone that is directing your learning rather than letting other people direct your learning. How much do you advise people like uh, and in the book, you talked about this idea of like talking or writing about the person that you want to become. Yeah. And I know Jordan Peterson has this um, has this software called uh, the self authoring program, which mm. I've done for a couple of years, which is like you write about the person that you you are now the person you are in the past and what you want to fix and the person that you mm. want to become. And mm. I think that exercise is really important because it's a lot of people want something like they want to be something they want to have mm. something whether a title or yeah. you know financial success but they don't really pinpoint who they want to become as a person mm. and i think that exercise of writing down and you talk about in the book about writing down who you want to become is a really yeah. powerful exercise it, it, it's very powerful and it's one of the it's one of the first things that we all learn when we qualify as a coach because okay. there's an exercise called be do have and in this exercise, what we learn as coaches is that most people focus on what they want to have. For example, I want to have the nice car. I want to have the big house. I want to have the title. I want to have the millions. Now, what happens is that just because you have that doesn't mean you can do the things you want to do and be who you want to be. Because you can have that, but you can still be someone who people don't want to spend time around. So you haven't really changed who you are as a person. Mm. But if you focus on the other way around, and if you start with who do you want to be? Now, once you become that person, you can do what you want and have what you want because you're operating from a very different place. And so for me, writing down a statement of who I want to be, what I do is, for me personally, I write it in the present tense. Mm. So you know, some people write in the future tense, some people will give a date for it. For me, I write it in the present tense because I find there is something powerful. Whenever I read that statement in the present tense, it feels like I'm already there. Mm. 
Mm. Even though I'm living in the present, I'm accessing that future Simon as if he was here now, as if I am living and breathing that Simon today. And I think what happens is that activates a certain level of energy within you. Because when you're operating as if you're already that future person, then what happens is you show up very differently. Uh, it, it is like what Usain Bolt said in response to how he became Usain Bolt. He said, I started to act as if I was already a world record breaking Olympic gold medalist. And he said, the moment I was acting like that in the present, I got up earlier, I trained harder, I hired the best coaches, nutritionists and mentors into my team. And I started to show up every day as a champion. So when I did eventually become a champion, it was a natural consequence of the fact I already saw myself as one. That's so powerful as well, because I think a lot of people, they want to embody or they they choose to embody something or they feel like they have to embody something once they have the title. Mm. But it's such an easy exercise to, you know, become the person that you want to become today, mm. you know, and it's just that belief that you can become it rather than just a title or what other people say about you or other people think about you. I mean, it's a it's a small shift, but it has monumental consequences in a positive way. I, I mean, when, when we think about title or working as if we're already our future self, what we're really playing with here is the concept of identity. You know, once you operate from a certain identity, your choices, your behaviors and your actions are already determined. So, so to give an example, if you were to go to your local supermarket and you operate from the identity of I am an athlete, then guess what? You're not going to push your trolley into the junk food aisle or the microwave food section. Your trolley is naturally going to go into the fresh food, the fresh fruit and the things that are actually healthy for our diet. You don't have to make that decision or choose where you're going to go shop because when you operate from that identity, your choice is already made. And so that was very much to my journey. Uh, but when I reflect back on it, yeah, the moment I started to see myself as a coach, as an entrepreneur, as the CEO of my business, that's when I started to show up differently, even though I was still in a full-time job at a time. Because I was already transitioning how I saw myself when I, from an identity point of view, mentally, then how I showed up became very different and i think i think that's a very unique position because i think i'm somewhat that position as well it's like you're sort of wearing many different hats yeah. and i think when you wear many many different hats you you struggle with this level of like well, who am i am i this am i that and it's almost like you have to embody the the different persona you know there's this really interesting book by todd herman he came on the podcast called um the alter ego effect mm. and this is ideas like everything that you do you're sort of a different person you have to embody that it's like mm. you're a superhero in every different situation in your life and you have to embody that persona in that different situation mm. i mean i can relate to that because when when i was in my full-time job i i felt like superman but without the superpowers so I would go into the office with a white shirt, tie and a suit, and I would have my bag with me. Inside my bag would be my now customary black t-shirt and jeans. And so when I would go and see a potential client or I would attend a networking event, I would go into a toilet cubicle, change out of my suit, put on my black t-shirt and jeans and race out of the building to get to that event. And so I was living this double identity, this double life for a number of years before I could collapse the two identities into one. Uh, and that only happened once I started to pursue what I now do today. I would, I'd love to know the story behind the black t-shirt and the jeans. Why did you choose that? Was that like some of like inspiration from Steve Jobs about like the, <laughs> the lack of decision-making and, and the importance of just wearing the same thing every day? Like what, why did you choose the black t-shirt and, and jeans? A lot to do with what you just shared, actually. Uh, I mean, when I was yeah. transitioning out of the corporate industry to, to what I now do, part of it was because I I wasn't a big fan of suits. Uh, you, you know, if I'm going to wear mm. something, I want to wear a tuxedo to a special I'm with you on event. that. <laughs> uh, I don't mind wearing a tuxedo because it, it, it's a special occasion. Uh, you feel good about yourself. But I never enjoyed wearing wearing a suit. And so when I, when I, when I was choosing what to wear, in the beginning it was white t-shirt, gray t-shirt, or black t-shirt and jeans. And that was my choice. Uh, but then I wanted to simplify that even further. 
Uh, then I said, okay, I'm just going to have black t-shirt because it meant that I didn't have to decide what to wear each morning. Uh, and, and so that just became my uniform, uh, black t-shirt and jeans. Uh, and, and now it's uh, something that, I, that, that, that friends of mine often joke with me about. So when they see me in a suit or, uh, or something different to black t-shirt and jeans, they always poke out, oh, uh, you, you're straying off brand here, Simon. <laughs> I love that though because I love that because you know is that decision making and and your books are around like energy management and I think a lot of people spend you know too much time and attention on things mm. that perhaps don't don't I'm not going to say don't matter but they you know they take away time from things that actually matter and I think the more yeah. that you understand and think about energy management the more you realize you know there's little decisions that you're making every single day that mm you know, accumulate over, you know, a day, a week, a month, that, mm. that really reduce your ability to think about where you want to go and, and reflect. Like I, I, the way I think about it is like, you talked about like what you wear every day, but I always almost think about what you're having for breakfast. It's like, mm. don't put so much thought into it. Just have the same thing every morning because then you can get into your day. There's no, you know, there's a, there's a routine there. There's a, there's a familiarity, which I think, you know, really kickstarts your day in a great way. Definitely. And I think it's, it's, it's again, goes back to, to the awareness of how much time these things take. Uh, you, you know, we've spoken about the mm -hmm. uniform that I choose, but also when I, when I think about my diet, you, you know, one of the tools that I share in the very first chapter of the book is the fact that I meal plan every week. Yeah. So my, my breakfast is only a rotation between two or three uh, different meals and then I already know ahead of time what I'm going to eat on each day of the week um, and so because I already know that I don't have to think about what am I going to cook tonight because it's already been planned it's already been scheduled so Monday we're going to eat x Tuesday b Wednesday c and so on uh, then I already know what I need to buy what I need to cook and it, again eliminates that decision making process otherwise I could spend hours looking through a recipe book and trying to decide what to cook that night. In the same way, a lot of people spend probably more time scrolling through the Netflix menu, deciding what to watch rather than actually watching uh, the actual show. In in the book, you talk about wanting to to really elevate your level of thinking and, and reflection. Uh, what are some of the tools and and what are some of the things that you advise to allow people to really transition from, you know, that level of self reflection? Mm -hmm. Do you recommend journaling? Do you recommend, you know? Um, you know, I've had people talk about videoing yourself and speaking like mm -hmm. a video diary. Like, how do you suggest people go down the route of reflection and, and really enhancing their ability to do that? Sure. I'm, I mean, I would certainly recommend journaling. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote that I share in a book by, uh, by a lady called Diana Chow. And she says that writing is humanity distilled into ink. Very powerful quote because what it teaches us is that by simply downloading our thoughts from our minds and onto paper, that process allows us to understand ourselves at a deeper level. And the reason why this journaling or writing is so important is you cannot have true self development without self awareness because you can't change what you're not aware of. And so, by doing this activity, what you're doing is you're deepening the relationship that you have with your thoughts. Uh, once you put it onto paper, you are then thinking about, well, is this thought true or not? Is this thought helpful or not? Uh, how can I organize my thinking in a way that reveals the next step? And so all of this stuff that comes from writing is very powerful. And once you deepen that sense of self-awareness, what happens is that this begins the path of true wisdom. Wisdom begins with knowing yourself. Because once you know where you are today, once you know what your obstacles are, once you know how your thinking is stopping or helping you, then that starts to set the path for you on how to progress tomorrow, the next day and the next week. I think that vision, I think we've been talking about quite a bit, that vision about writing. Like I, I mm. when, when I approach journaling, it's more not on what's happened but it's more mm. what is happening. Like you said in, before, yeah. it's like that present tense because, you know, you can get into this thinking about, you know, what's happened in the past and you become marred mm. and it's difficult to move away from that. But if I think if you talk about in present tense, you're always looking about what you can improve and what you can do next. Yeah. And I mean, when, when you think about present tense as well, I mean, the present is all we have control over. You know, the ability to be present, not to be weighed down by what happened yesterday 
or not to be filled with, with anxiety about what is to come tomorrow, but just to live in that present moment, to tap into that awareness of the moment, I think is a very special skill. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, there's a, the, 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 there's a story I share in a book uh, from the Netflix show, The Last Dance, in which one of Michael Jordan's coaches was asked, what made Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan? And he said it wasn't because he was the tallest or the hardest worker. He said those things are given if you're playing in the NBA because you have to be naturally tall to be a great basketball player Mm -hmm. and you have to work hard to make the first team. And so what he said made Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan was the fact that he had this ability to be absolutely present when he was on the court. He didn't care about the last shot. He wasn't worried about the next shot. He was so focused in the present shot that he was about to take. He lived in the absolute moment. And that's what made him so different to his competitors. He was able to have a certain level of awareness that comes from living in the present. Yeah, living in the present and also understanding, you know, learning from the past and thinking about the future. It's like that. Just like we said earlier, it's you're living three lives at once, aren't you? You're living yeah. your past, your your present, and your future, and it's trying to balance all those at at one point. Mm-hmm. And I think for many of us, we we don't get to touch that present because we we spend more time and energy on the past or the future, such that we we end up living as if we're never going to die, and then dying having never really lived, and we look back and we realize that it was those small moments that actually were the big things. Yeah. That the past and the past and future guides the present. That's the way that I like to think about mm. it. It's like mm. your past guides your present and your future guides your present. Like it's, you can't, I think once you start going either raw down the past or the yeah. future, you sort of, you, you go a bit astray. Definitely. And I think the, uh, the word here to, to, to sort of emphasize is to learn from the past, to learn from the future but not to live in them. Learn in general. That's what I like to say. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we like to do over here, Simon. We like to learn. We like to read. We like to be curious. Um, and uh, and yeah, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it, you know, to discuss your book, Energize, make the most out of every moment. You've got the book right here. Um, where's the best place that individuals can find you, Simon, whether it be social media or website? Sure. So to find out more about the book and auto copy, you can go to getenergizedbook.com. That is energized with a Z. In terms of social media, I'm on, I'm on all the major social platforms, but the two that I use most frequently are LinkedIn and Instagram. On Instagram, my handle is at Simon Alexander O. Perfect. I'll put the links to, to all those in the description below. Um, so people can check you out and, and definitely read the book or reach out to you for any more questions. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. Thank you, Simon. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really hope that you learned something from what Simon and I discussed. And if you wanted to learn more, then I definitely recommend picking up the book. I'll put the link to the book in the description below so you can go and get it there. If you did find this podcast helpful, then I definitely recommend subscribing to the podcast. I try and get this podcast out a bit more. It's been a couple of months since I've got this out, but I try and get the podcast out as frequently as I can. So the best way that you can support the channel is to subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, definitely recommend heading over to our YouTube channel, Book Talk Today and subscribing there. Thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.